I'm back again. <laughs> hey folks, Joseph A. Sabora here as we continue with the Terminator film franchise. I'm going to be reviewing the fourth installment in the series. Uh, but before I get to that, uh, I forgot to mention uh, previously with my review of Terminator 3 Rise of the Machines that Schwarzenegger was becoming a political candidate while he was playing the Terminator. And later on, he actually won for the governor of California after Ray Davis had left. Yeah, since he resigned. So now, he's considered as the governor. <laughs> yeah, he took over for office from 2003 all the way until 2011 when he was replaced by Governor Moonbeam. <laughs> Yeah, of course, as someone referred to. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to get to that, but we already know who he is. Well, anyway, um, both uh, producers Mario Casar and Andrew Bryna, after they just produced uh, T3 through their production company uh, C2 Pictures, they bought the rights to the Terminator franchise and they were going to be ready to work on a fourth installment to see where it le leads off. Like, this time they're going to get Nick Stahl and Claire Danes to reprise their roles as John Connor and Kate Booster. But, you know, things have changed and they wanted to become more post-apocalyptic future as we've seen. And they were getting some new choices here. But, Trouble went through, I mean, with post-productions and all this other stuff, with pre-productions pre that was happening. So now, I'm hoping that they were going to get Jonathan Mastow to continue directing, joining in with the script by John Recanto and Michael Ferris to return. That this time we're going to finally get what we were hoping for. But... That took a lot longer than we thought because later on we were getting the TV series The Terminator Sarah Connor Chronicles uh, for Fox, which we had Linda Headley, Summer Glaive from Firefly and Serenity, and Thomas Deckard from the TV series uh, Honey I Shrunk the Kids to join in, and this was going to be the continuation of the story, which now they had to change the uh, storyline becoming more alternative than become more alternate than ever before so this time um, because I know Sarah Connor's uh, character was killed off um, in the storyline for the third film that well they don't want her character to be killed off once again so now they want to fix that problem they now throw in a very strong storyline and everything's all set up so now seeing that the, the rise of the machines are going to come by and you know, coming from the future and into the present to go after Priscilla and her son John with the protection of of a female Terminator and, and all of this. That sort of thing. So now we have, as we speak, um, here's the fourth installment called Terminator Salvation. Uh, this time it stars Christian Bale you know, a Welsh actor best known for films like, you know, the Dark Knight trilogy where he plays Bruce Wayne and Batman, you know, provided the voice. But he also has done, like, several films in his career. Like, he did films like Metroland, All the Little Animals, uh, uh, the 1994 adaptation of Little Woman, uh, Emperor of the Sun that Steven Spielberg directed, underrated gem, by the way. Yeah, he was a kid. Um, even the American Psycho. <laughs> yeah, that was his best performance. So. Um, but this time he plays a resistance leader, John Connor, who would soon become the leader of the resistance. But he's actually working with the general, you know, played by uh, Michael Ironside. So he's he's about to fight back between which in a nuclear war that. So he's fighting back um, after the nuclear holocaust uh, had appeared in 2003, you know, 
that Skynet suddenly had sent, yeah, because Skynet's um, machines have been self-aware and now they're all rising and that's where it becomes a battle between the human race and, and the machines. So it was one less hope for survival. And then we get a death world inmate who happens to be a hybrid between a human and a cyborg. And it's played by Sam Wolverton as Marcus Wright. And we're joined in with the supporting cast. Uh, besides Michael Ironside, we got uh, Anton Yelchin, God rest his soul. He plays Kyle Reese, almost like uh, a very younger version of him. We got Moon Bloodgood, uh, Bryce Dallas Howard, who's playing the, his wife, uh, Kate Brewster. Only this time she's a physician and, and not a veterinarian. Common and Helen Bolaham Carter, yes. Actress who um, was the husband of um, Tim Burton. Not to mention uh, she appeared in, in many films. Uh, she's a British actress known for films like, for the Merchant Ivory films like A Room of the View, Where Angels Fear to Tread. Howard's in, but of course, Red and Burton films like um, uh, Big Fish, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, even the Sweeney Todd, those movies. So, nice cast. Uh, it's being directed by McGee this time, after Jonathan Mastow had left. Um, this was an oddball choice. Because even though he is a fan of the Terminator movies, that he figured, you know, he might be the right choice to you know, bring in some practical effects and CGI done by OM and, and the Stan Winston studio to provide everything and make the story so structure even better than before. Because this is the same director who gave us the Charlie's Angels films, yeah, all of which just plays out like like your typical Michael Bay uh, movie, but with lots of sexy girls and explosions. I mean, that's his style. Because, of course, McGee is a music video director, and, and he's been doing a lot of this stuff for, for some time. I almost feel like this is exactly what Transformers was suffering, too. I mean, when Bay took over. <laughs> so uh, that's what I feared. Although, I, again, I didn't mind the, the Transformers movies, though. Because, <laughs> hey, I love Transformers. I've been a fan of it. But that's another different breed here. <laughs> okay, okay. All right. Anyway, uh, this is the Blu-ray I picked up. That's the director's cut. Yes, they have both the theatrical cut and director's cut included. Yeah, the director's cut is R-rated, so it only has, like, three minutes of scenes uh, not shown in theaters. So now you get to see some brief nudity scenes of of um, several characters, or, uh, well, one of the characters, and and some of the violence um, were a bit bloody, not too bloody, but but I guess it's close enough to being R-rated. So. I mean, I know it's not enough, but that's what they have to provide here. And, of course, you get the immersive uh, Warner Brothers Maximum Movie Mode. And, yeah, you can see the screenshot of the director, McGee. Yeah, he's also known as Joseph uh, McGinley. Um, where you see the two uh, screenshots. Yeah, one where they show the movie, and the other one they show the behind-the-scenes footage on how they shot that. You know, they shot it on location at the Albuquerque Studios in New Mexico where they actually created the post-apocalyptic future to make it look exactly what it looked like if, if Los Angeles had been all destroyed, gritty, and, well, all desert-like. That's exactly what we're expecting. Something like Mad Max, in a way. Um, I know, and that's just uh, the picture of the the skull, the indoor skeleton, so it almost seems like just a shot of the city. So that's what we experience. 
So it has like um, the picture in picture with storyboard uh, comparisons, Terminator mythology a timeline that they included. So it takes place from all the first three films all the way to the fourth installment and maybe later on as we speak. And it has a um, lot has some cast and crews interviews um, included. Has a, a lot of galleries and a lot of uh, commentaries here and there. Um, all show and in, in the screen uh, split screens and all that. So they have access to to show you that. They have exclusive few. They do have exclusive features from BD Live. Uh, the features that they also included are the Moto Terminator, yeah, the one with the motorcycles that came directly from the uh, the giant uh, cyborg that's like the T1, the the T, yeah, the T1. That's very huge. It's known as the Harvest, and that's where on the bottom of his legs he sent out two uh, motorcycles uh, that run by themselves. That's why they're called. Model Terminators. They even got uh, Reforging the Future, which talks about how the filmmakers revented the franchise and add some depths um, that were never before seen. So amazing. Yeah, and it has a digital copy, which is <laughs> already expired, so what's the point? Um, yeah, they always do this. Um, nice slipcover, by the way. Um, same as usual. Uh, Okay, let's try and see if I can open it. So again, you get uh, <laughs> just the uh, digital copy info and just um, advertisements for all these um, rewards. It's hard, it's hard to cover it, but uh, let me see. Yeah, it's just awards, but I bet they're already expired anyway, so no point. And just some other information. Uh, this is what the cover art looks like on, in, on the theatrical cut with the special features. Um, and here's, of course, uh, the same as usual. And I know it's hard to home. And it does have the digital copies so and letter cover art. So it's um, really neat. Um, also, um, I'm going to try to talk about. Um, that another company had took over for the production uh, after you know they were having some trouble with uh, C2 Pictures. It eventually became the the Halcyon Company that was owned by uh, two producers, uh, Victor Kabysik and Derek Anderson. So they joined in to take over for the Terminator franchise. So that's where when we get to the second season of the show uh, Terminator Sarah Connor Chronicles, yeah they took over so now they're providing the rights but that wasn't working out later on either because they were going for bankruptcy problems too yeah. oh and of course um, I guess we couldn't forget uh, the incident that happened while on set was when Christian Bale was doing an important role of Connor and suddenly the DP by the name of Shane suddenly uh, distracted him and he walked on set trying to fix some of the light fixtures you know, during that scene and he got so frustrated and angry that he was threatened to beat, beat the crap out of him and you know he started cursing a lot that I, I understand you know you know, he's a professional. I mean, we all felt the same way. You know, they practice, you know, reading the script and they're trying to get the role exactly right. That, yeah, it could be a total distraction to see what happens um, during the problem on set. And so he berated him and everyone else. And he talks to McGee about what's going on. And apparently he didn't pay attention. Um, and I know Bell was going for troubles too. You know, he got arrested um, while at, at the local hotel. He was having a party, and I guess something went wrong. The sound man actually recorded this, and 
the, this conversation that happened that and then all of a sudden it went viral yeah they, they posted it on YouTube and and since then you know everyone else they reported it so uh, you know entertainment tonight uh, a lot of news reports you know, extra access Hollywood you name it I mean they were like oh my god what was going on with him and but then uh, there was an interview um, on K Rock by Kevin and Bean, and it turns out that it was Christian Bale himself uh, joining in. I know they were afraid because he was going to start uh, you know, attacking them, but yeah, he realized that no, it's not a joke. I mean, it really is me, and I, I just wanted to talk about what just happened on set, and I, it's my fault that I started acting like an ass. Uh, but in, in the end of the day, you know, he saw the dailies, he saw everything that was shot, and everything was amazing, shot perfectly, exactly what we expected. So it, Shane uh, Hill brought, um, actually did a great job um, with the shots. So I guess he was just having some problems, maybe, with, with the camera work and, and the light fixtures directly from it. So, <laughs> that was like uh, really hard. Okay. But in the end, you know, everything turned out alright for him. I mean, I mean, it's hard to believe that this incident becomes, you know, almost bad publicity for the Terminator franchise. I mean, we don't want that. Okay. So now let's uh, get to the review. And yes, this time Warner Brothers uh, had co-produced the film. Uh, with Columbia Pictures um, providing the international rights. Um, of course with the company, the High Sion Company and Wonderland Sound and Vision, so they teamed up. So now, this is yet to come here. So anyway, it stars Christian Bell once again, Sam Wilburton, who wait, later went on to do Avatar, or at this rate, he was doing Avatar while um, working on this. Anton Yelchin, a yeah, great actor, God rest his soul. He was actually in the movie Star Trek from 2009, the same year. Uh, Moon Bloodgood, uh, I know she was in the, the TV series Falling Skies on TNT. I never watched that show, so I can't say. Um, Bryce Dallas Howard, of course, she was in the, the M. Light Shyamalan films, uh, which turned out to be awful. Uh, the Village and Lady in the Water, but of course she went on to do uh, Spider-Man Free as Gwen Stacy. And then she went on to do um, Jurassic World, along with its sequel, Fallen Kingdom. Uh, Common, he's a rapper. But he's been doing a lot of um, movies in his career. Yeah, he went on to do John Wick 2. Uh, he also was in the movie uh, with uh, Steve Carell and Tina Fey called uh, Date Night. That's him. Uh, Helen Bonham Carter. Uh, Michael Ironside. Yeah, from Total Recall and, and Search of Troopers. Jada Grace uh, Barry, she's a singer. Uh, Brian Steele. Plus, we got um, Arnold Schwarzenegger making a bit of a uh, a digital uh, cameo in a way because they actually use a bodybuilder to provide him. Yeah, this is a special request to, to show, and I'm going to talk about that afterwards. And we got uh, Linda Hamilton. Um, Providing the uncredited voice of Sarah Connor, only heard in in recording tapes. Um, it's written by John Bacano and Michael Ferris, and it's directed by McGee. The movie began set in 2003. Dr. Serena Colgan, played by Helen Bonham Carter, who's the head of Cyberdyne Systems, had convinced an id mate, Marcus Wright, played by Sam Wilburton, to sign over his body for medical research following his execution. 
later on Skynet uh, automated system had been activated and became self-aware perceiving humans as a threat which starts a nuclear holocaust to educate them in the event known as Judgment Day which that's where we had the strong ending in Terminator 3 Rise of the Machines. Flash forward to 2018 John Connor is a resistance fighter who will soon become the leader of the resistance played by Christian Bale leads an attack on the Skynet base where he discovered human prisoners and schematics by incorporating living tissue to a new type of Terminator which is the T-800 yep Schwarzenegger you know, playing the role so John suddenly survives an explosion on the base you know with all these satellite dishes around a lot of cyborgs appearing and that's where it had an attack then Connor suddenly wants up straight into the helicopter to escape yeah, one pilot died and starts to drive all the way through this windstorm from the desert and then crashes but he survived though then Marcus had emerged uh, from the base wreckage and begins to walk towards Los Angeles so this was like a take on the Wizard of Oz and Alice in Wonderland so Marcus is like Dorothy or Alice for that matter like he's in somewhat of a fish out of water s story that he didn't ex imagine to experience you know like he thought maybe he was dead but it turns out that he was alive anyway John returns to the resistance headquarters that's located aboard a nuclear submarine that's headed by General Hugh Ashdown that the resistance had discovered a hidden signal containing a code protocol which believed would initiate a shutdown of Skynet's machines um, so for this intelligence the resistance planned to launch an offensive against the Skynet headquarters in San Francisco which among the resistance that the offensive will commence in four days due to an inceptive kill list created by them planning to terminate the resistance command staff within the same time frame which that includes uh, a young Kao Reese played by Antel Yetchen so he's second on the list so they are aware of his importance but John knows that Kao will eventually travel back in time to become the father of John that was um, born with uh, Sarah Connor which at that rate it happened in the 1984 film which he was sent back in time to 1984 to protect uh, Sarah Connor meanwhile the Terminator T-800 was sent back in time to kill her so we know how that story went for of course time travel um, wasn't there yet but it was going to the point where it's going to happen so there's no time traveling the story in in this uh, particular future as we speak because we didn't see that but we know that it's going to happen later on especially with Genesis yeah, okay. so but anyway but arriving already in Los Angeles in ruins uh, Mark suddenly encounters uh, Kyle Reese um, joining in with an eight-year-old girl named Star, who's a mute, ever since uh, she was born after Judgment Day, and she couldn't speak at all because it really affected her after the trauma. So she's one of the survivors uh, joining in, only to be attacked by all these machines uh, run by Skynet. Uh, yeah, like you have the the cyborg with the machine gun attacking them so they're trying to find a place to hide and the next thing you know they're about to steal a jeep somewhere in the Griffin Observatory where they're about to steal it so they can be able to get past all these machines like that huge drone that was a chasing after them and then they went straight all the way to a local gas station which is already in ruins all tattered up you can see a 7-eleven inside they went inside to get some food and fuel so they'll be on their way and for another attack 
Uh, that's where we meet all, all the survivors of, of the humans. So they're joined by for another resistance base. Uh, it was actually led by uh, Jane Alexander, uh, the, the older woman, only to be taken by a giant uh, cyborg that's as huge as ever, called the Harvest. I think that's what it's called. And underneath the two legs, you see those two motor uh, terminators, you know, the motorcycle ones, all running by themselves, advanced. They're about to chase after Marcus, along with Cow and Star, also attacking the rest of the other humans, or even taking them directly into this huge drone, which they're about to be held prisoners inside the, the mate. Marcus was trying to get them out of there, taking the axe, but it was too late. And then suddenly, um, the Resistance had sent out um, two AT... A-10 airplanes um, to attack these um, drones and other machines to accept the machine transport but then Marcus suddenly located a, a down pilot named Blair Williams who's played by Moon Bloodgood uh, so since th so through the course uh, you know they were just trying to communicate with each other you know making love and all that other stuff they're also attacking those other guys on base, but, you know, so on and so forth. And then they're about to make their way straight to uh, John's base, uh, where thereafter he was being ruined by a magnetic landmine. They got caught. And then he was suddenly sent directly to the base, you know, performing surgery to see what happens to Marcus. Yeah, that's where we meet uh, Kate Brewster, played by Bryce Dallas Howard, which we met earlier in the film, but she's pregnant, so she's a physician. Um, but she came by because also uh, John Connor had listened to all the, the recorded tapes uh, that Sarah Connor had recorded uh, you know, at the time when, you know, before he was born, uh, Sarah was already wearing this uh, workout outfit, uh, brought in a dog and driving a jeep he was ready to go all the way to Mexico to meet her friends which collected all the weaponry and other stuff for survival and yeah during a huge storm that's about to happen yeah also a picture of Sarah that was taken from the little kid as we all remembered it was nice to hear Hamilton's voice uh, again for the recording tapes so it might, it might have taken some time. So, anyway, attempting to save his life, the resistance fighters discover that Marcus happens to be, as we speak, a cyborg. You know, he's a hybrid between human and, and cyborg, where she has a mechanical indoor skeleton inside with a partially artificial cerebral cortex. Yeah, he even has a heart inside that's beating. And on his skull he does have a CPU chip but he does think like a human acts like a human moves like a human but he just didn't know that he was a machine the whole time but he always believes that he was human anyway John and Kate uh, have think that Marcus has been sent to execute him in order to be killed but that's where Blair starts to help Marcus escape yeah, because I know Marcus was all tied up. Yeah, I know he was like shut down. You know, that's where he got common. You know, playing the one of the resistant fighters and all those other guys. So they were trying to find a way to um, go after uh, Marcus, and they're trying to find out what's going on. But then, yeah, Marcus is being chased over uh, along with uh, Blair. But I know they, they set this up. There's like a battle between the Resistance and him. I mean, John thinks that Marcus was the one responsible for going after his mother, Sarah. And he was the one that sent by to kill her. I mean, that's what he fought in his mind. But he knows that he's, he doesn't know any of that. I mean, he didn't do any of this stuff. You know, it's not him. 
Anyway, there, there's like a shootout um, all the way um, through the yeah, through the for yeah through the forest around. Yeah, they, there's like a blast of napalm that they shot in. Yeah, sort of like uh, apocalyptic now type <laughs> if you think about it. Uh, but underneath, um, but underneath the um, the swamp, you see uh, all these hydro. Uh, you see all these hydrobots uh, appearing. Yeah, the ones that look like metallic uh, eels. They're, c they're coming by. You know, they did found one before, but it has all these clamps that attacks them completely. So John's about to stop them, and then Marcus suddenly appears. Yeah, I know he got shot down and, and everything. He shot. They shot his hand. Uh, Blair got shot in the leg, but they caught uh, they caught her and just put her there for a while. So this is like a setup here. Well, because of what's happening, uh, John suddenly. Um, uh, but because of what's going on, John decided to join in with Marcus to find a way to stop uh, Skynet from happening, so they'll be able to launch an attack, and they're going to try to find a way to stop time travel to to happen with the Terminator G800. And so. Their plan was to actually go all the way to Cyberdyne Systems, where they had all these machines. Uh, you go inside the factory where they're building all these cyborgs and all of that. Um, we also learned that Kyle Reese and, and the rest of the prisoners are actually held there. So there, it was up to them to save them um, under the orders of General Ashdown to delay the offensive so it could form a plan to, to save all the humans. So that's what they're trying to do, and to save uh, Reese. And once uh, John finally enters, um, along with Marcus, Marcus was starting to become more advanced than ever. You know, he, he went inside uh, to lock in the, to encode the uh, the system to start uh, Cyberdyne systems, and that's where we spot uh, Serena. And then he was already, you know, fixing all the parts that he needs to make him look exactly what he should be, like a human. So he, he got himself fixed, uh, but then he's telling them that um, already advanced that he was going to be programmed to kill John Connor. But he doesn't want that to happen, so he, he just wants to help him and be able to stop all these cyborgs from coming. And by the way, when we finally got to see Terminator T-800, that's where we got to see Schwarzenegger. And the bodybuilder, of course, was played by Roland Kickhanger, um, all covered in livid tissue. They actually uh, used the CGI effects by LOM. They put it all together. And they, made, and they actually used some footages from the 1984 film to put together to make him look exactly real. And I'm surprised with all that technology they can actually make uh, the 1984 Terminator come to life. Because <laughs> we all know that by the time this happened, Schwarzenegger was still in office, so he didn't, couldn't appear. So that was really nice. Um, they also had another athlete named Marsui Pazanzaski or something. I don't know how to pronounce it, but he was going to double for him you know, for all these other scenes. Wow. So yeah, it was up to them to actually uh, save them and hoping that they'll be able to detonate uh, using all these uh, the nuclear uh, bombs that they had, yeah, the ones that you actually saw in the third film, to which causes a nuclear explosion. And that's exactly what Connor was about to detonate you know, after the fight scene between all these other cyborgs and then the Terminator T-800. Yeah, and it goes directly to the Mon Lava, and it goes to the to the uh, li liquid nitrogen that they put into it to freeze them. But it just keeps on going and going, and then finally they stopped it. Uh, one one Terminator actually uh, stopped his heart of, of Marcus until Connor just came and already getting attacked and he he got like stabbed, uh, but he was ready to uh, bring Marcus back to life before 
you know, he finally stops the Terminator and then Marcus came to life and stopped it as well. So there you go. And now they finally detonated the, the entire factory and of Cyberdyne systems. But unfortunately, Connor was wounded. And so it's going straight directly to his heart, so and he won't be able to live much longer. So they had to perform surgery. And at this rate, um, it was Marcus who wanted to um, take his heart, seeing it, that if Connor wasn't going to live at all. Uh, also, I forgot that he also got the, that huge scar that was scraped by the Terminator. So I know that's exactly how he looked later on uh, when he becomes the leader of the resistance. Um, the general uh, Ashdown along with the rest had died uh, during that explosion. But now um, he decided to donate his heart, you know, Marcus, to Connor so that way he'll be able to live forever. And they're going to start continuing the fights until it's over. So that's your perfect ending to Terminator Salvation. And I'm going to say, um, in my opinion, I think it's the last good Terminator film we ever had. And I think this could have been, quite honestly, the last of the series. I mean, following the Terminator Zeracona Chronicles. Um, but I, in my opinion, I thought it was, um, I thought it was excellent. Um, it's very underrated, just like the third film was, and, um, the characters uh, played it exactly what we expected. I mean, even though, yes, it was kind of tough to find a lot of casting choices to play the role. I mean, Bale was cast mostly because, you know, he was doing the, the Dark Knight trilogy, and, and he figured that, you know, the director McGee wanted him because he figured he's the most credible action star of the entire world, so he'll be the right choice. So he wasn't so sure how this was going to happen, but but I guess it worked in the end. So I, I didn't mind the, the casting choice of Bale. Uh, Wolverton, I mean, this is exactly uh, one of his... Uh, I think this is, might be his new role that he got, I mean, because at the time he was doing Avatar with James Cameron, that um, I thought he was pretty impressive playing the, a, an inmate uh, who's a hybrid uh, between a human and a Terminator, but he's, but he's actually uh, a good Terminator, but he can be not exactly, as a human, he was not exactly the a good type of guy as you may think, but but he'll be able to uh, do what he can. Um, so I, I thought he was um, perfect for the role in my opinion. Um, another one that's perfect, even better, is Anton Yelchin. And the way he played Reese is exactly like how Michael Bean played him. You know, he, he was ready to become a soldier. But he even explained that in the scene that he didn't have a badge yet so yes he's he's a young soldier for the resistance he's going to join in but in order to earn his right he will be able to receive the badge and he's going to become the next soldier to um, to be chosen to time travel back to save Sarah Connor and I love that and I, I really miss the actor. I mean, he, he's a great actor. He, he, you know, if he was still alive today, he'd be doing a lot of stuff. Uh, Moonbuck Lud was also good, too. Um, actually, she was um, a very uh, tough female role right there that we got. I mean, not only is she the pilot, but it also serves as a romantic interest for Marcus. And I thought she was great. I mean, we also get to see a nude scene with her. Yeah, like a brief nude scene where she takes off her top. Um, about to cover her breast. But you do see a little bit of that. And 
about to make love because, of course, you know, good guys are hard to find. Just like good girls are hard to find, too. Um, yeah. Uh, Bryce Dallas Howard um, was all right as Kate. I mean, I know... I heard that they were going to get Charlotte Gainsbourg to play the role, but... But it was because of scheduling conflict, so I, I think she would have been a better choice, in my opinion. But I guess Bryce was all right, but it's just too bad. She kind of lost the, the strong sensitivity that Claire Danes played uh, when she was a veterinarian at the time. I, I, I understand. She's, she was more soft. And uh, Common plays Barnes. Yeah, he's the right-hand man for John Connor. Um... I guess, you know, this is the kind of character where he doesn't want to play a bulky uh, kind of guy, but he's just there to, to join in for the emotional side and how he works together as a team. Um, it's nice to see uh, Michael Ironside in the film, uh, playing the general. I mean, it works so well. But we know what will happen at the end. Uh, it's nice to see uh, Hedden Bonham Carter joining in. You know, playing the role who happens to be the head of uh, Cyberdyne Systems and, and the one who runs Skynet. So, apparently she is. Um, Jada Gray, uh, and of course, Jada Grace Berry, a star. Excellent. Considering she doesn't speak. Um, all the special effects were done by... The Stan Winston Studios team, yeah, Stan Winston passed away in 2008, um, so they dedicated to his honor, so they actually brought in uh, the other team to actually provide the effects, a practical, and some, with IOM joining in for the, the CGI digital effects, they also had some other teams of, of the digital effects team to provide it. They they had all these stunt um, coordinators, you know, with stunt people, you know, dressing up in Beckle suits to provide it the the indoor skeleton cyborgs to play the part, doing all these movements and everything, um, and all the other surprises that they have. Um, so they did an amazing job, and I guess McGee actually learned that you know because he's been doing some action films for a while that. <laughs> I guess even for a fan, he can actually uh, do whatever he wants. You know, he can he wants the the film to be exactly what a Terminator film should be, even though it isn't exactly an actual Terminator film as we all know it, but it, but more like a Bad Max uh, type of story built in for with all the the war between humans and, and machines. So I, I guess, the, you know, they, they did the best they could. I do wish um, it got some better uh, critical responses, though. I know it got a mixed reviews from critics. It had a 33% of Rotten Tomatoes, which I don't understand. I mean, that's why, you know, it's it's become more underrated than ever. I don't think it's as bad as people think. I know, th I know there are other people who feel the same way, but, hey, that's just me. Uh, the score was done by Danny Elfman, you know, took in over for um, Marco Beltrami and, and, of course, Black for Dell. So he did provide the theme for this and also frozen the theme for from Brad for Dell. So we're now we're familiar with uh, the same beat. So um, as it follows, I know the script. Um, it does have flaws. I can understand that. You know, there are some issues here and there that needed to be fixed. Um, they did provide a conflict. They provided a lot of um, energy as they could. Sometimes it could be a little bland. Other times, you know, they, they try to go completely strong. But um, that's how it had to be. But for its a $200 million project, I mean, with marketing joining in. It actually did pretty well at the box office, surprisingly. Uh, for uh, May of Memorial Day weekend, and I know there was joining in with uh, other films coming out. That it was perfect. Um, 
well, for its budget alone. But, I mean, the movie may not be a perfect continuation as it seems, but I still think it's a an excellent film. I mean, I will never hold a candle again, just like the third film, to the first two movies, but still. I, l I like what's happening um, for the course of the mythology of the Terminator franchise, so I thought it really works. And you know what? The movie should have ended there. So I'm by it. But now we're stuck with Terminator Genesis and, of course, Terminator Dark Fate. But we expect the worst to come. And I already previously reviewed Terminator Genesis, so I'm, I'm not going to go back to reviewing that again. Even though it's in webcam form, I pretty much explained it, so I'm not going to waste my time. But, however, I am going to continue to see Dark Fate and see how this movie turned out for better or worse. So, anyway, that's Terminator Salvation, and I give the movie four stars. It's a little better than the third, but I think it, it joins into it. So, that's in my opinion. I know, I keep saying it. <laughs> I'm Joseph A. Sabora. And I'll see you later. Hoping to be back. Bye.